It's dark okay. outside. We're barking. Our, our theme is a bop, dude. What? Our theme is a bop. Like every yeah. time I hear it, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, this 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 slaps. I get kind of jazzed. I was getting ready to go to bed like probably an hour ago. And then uh, you know, I hear that song. I'm kind of juiced up and ready to go. I'm also juiced up about Jeff Sintel. Uh, he's joining us tonight. Um, I, I listen, best hair in the business. Sorry, <laughs> um Sorry, Brooks Austin. Jeff Jeff Sintel's got the best hair in the business. We're going to ask about product tonight. Yeah, we are. We're going to ask about <laughs> Paul Mitchell pomade. Um, you know, I know he's. I know he uses uh, uses some good stuff. Um, we got some inside scoop on Jeff Sintel. Um, you know, oh. and some and some stuff going down near the South Carolina border. Um, we may be talking about black tar heroin, or we may be talking about um, you know shrimp from Shim Creek. You know, Charleston, South Carolina. We really don't know. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to have Jess and tell on. We're going to have a good time. I, I, I went on Bill Shanks today, Roos, and uh, um, I told him, I was like, man, I went back and kind of listened to some clips from the show, and, uh, dude, it was such a blast. And he goes, hey, I just hope you'll have me on again. And I was like, dude, I don't think our listeners, our viewers, uh, would ever forgive us if we didn't have you on again. Everybody was talking about how they wanted him back. Uh, that was so much fun last week. Listen, we, I told you this. Uh, I think we talked earlier today, and I said we are getting some some raw takes from some people uh, when it comes to Bark After Dark, and that was what we wanted to do the show around. Right? Is like it's not super Georgia focused. It's not really. It's not really any. It's it's it's, 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 a, it's a Seinfeld it's a Seinfeld esque podcast. It's a it's a show about nothing. It's yeah. just. A, an exercise in self-indulgence uh, yeah, as, that's I've what it is. It, as i've called it before but we just hang out with our friends and we talk we need to, to them put like that in the show description <laughs> we need to put exercise and self-indulgence we really do uh, what uh, go ahead i'm sorry no i was just gonna say it's us hanging out with our friends talking to our friends like we talk to our friends when we're not in front of the cameras or, or mostly right. mostly how we talk to them yeah i mean i Bill Shanks used some words I hadn't heard before. So. Yeah, He's, he probably used some words that we we communicate in a lot, you know, more often when we talk to Dean Leggy, honestly. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, um, all right, let's get to our first kind of segment. We've got a segment we're going to come up with. It's not what we've come up with. It's not going to be tonight, but we're gonna we're gonna start this segment. You know, they need to be sent off and studied. Um, we're gonna bring up then. In the coming weeks, we're going to start digging up some stories and stuff on people. Some of the craziest people there are out there. There's plenty of news stories and stuff, and we're going to kind of rehash those. Um, pro definitely going to do those on the one-on-one -on -one shows when it's just me and Roos. Uh, and we may do that with our guests in the future. We were not uh, prepared to knock it out tonight. But we do have What Are You Drinking? And What Are You Drinking, Jake Roos? Tonight. Um, and I was uh, very conscious, actually, in this decision. Um, I was hanging out over at Buckball Brewing, my local brewery, a uh, big supporter of theirs, big fan of theirs, um, some of my finest friends, uh, and I moonlight there as a bartender once in a while even. Um, but the Yikes Bobby IPA um, is uh, what I'm drinking on tonight. It's a West Coast IPA, and I'll tell you the quick version of the story um, uh, behind the name of Yikes Bobby IPA. The, there was a guy who left some reviews uh, about Buckbald's beer. And several of the beers he left reviews on were not even on tap at the time at the tap room. Uh, he was just an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> and so one of uh, his, his uh, handle uh, on on tap was Bobby. And one of his reviews was yikes. And so uh, my great friend, Patrick, uh, who's the owner of the, uh, the brewery came in and said, all right, here's how we're going to deal with this. And he made a beer after Bobby and he called it yikes Bobby uh, after his review. And there's a description for this beer and it reads with all the other descriptions he left for the other beers. It's become one of the hottest selling beers at Buckball Brewing in Copper Hill, Tennessee and in Murphy, North Carolina. And um, it, that was his, it was like his, 
brewing vigilantism to get back at this guy, man. I mean, it was like, I told him, I was like, that is the greatest way to mess with somebody that I have ever seen. It's just to go out and make some money off of uh, them, them messing with you. Yep, absolutely. Just pour the pour the coals of kind of service that I'm going st- uh, straight sipping tequila tonight. Which one? Uh, this is uh, G4 um, Reposado. I'm a big Reposado guy. Um, so uh, the intel on this is that the uh, the juice, the agave, is rested in uh, George Dickel barrels. Um, so if it's anything like the George Dickel that I've drunk in my life, I probably need to go turn all the mirrors around in the house so that I don't try to fight myself. <laughs> I was I was gonna I was gonna say you need to you need to be hydrating heavily. George, so George, did... Dickel, George Dickel will bring the aggression out in a man, uh, from what I understand. <laughs> Uh, uh, it'll, uh, it'll make, I've, I've gotten in uh, real good wrestling matches with myself, I believe with some George Dickel, but now nah, this is, this is what, um, listen, this no additives. It's very, very pure. And it's one of those things, um, that is what like classy Azul and, and a lot of other stuff try to do, except they, they kind of overdo it a little bit and taste a little bit like vanilla extract. It's got a little bit of sweetness to it. Uh, really agave forward. It's amazing. I love it. Um, also got the, you know, I showed it last week, got a bottle of wild common that is, that is rested in, uh, in, uh, Buffalo trace barrels. Um, so, you know, you get a little bit of that bourbon tinge to it, but also just, you know, that beautiful, uh, fragrant, uh, tequila taste. Uh, do we have, yes, we do. We, we have, we have the, the best hair in the business <laughs> right now. Look at this guy. It's just beautiful. Good looking man. <laughs> What's up, Jeff? Oh, you're oh, muted. Jeff. You might be muted. Oh, wait, hold on. Here, we can do that. No, no I'm good. I'm good. You go. I'm okay. Like, you got me laughing already in like minute one, man. <laughs> hey, we, you know, is it, isn't that what we do when we all hang out, right? I mean, are we, is this like Fort Lauderdale again? And we're looking down at like the nine, the nine pools of the Hard Rock Cafe when we're at media night or something like that? Well, I can't, you know, I mean, I can't get into the club because I got flip flops on, right? <laughs> what happened over at the uh, at the hard rock <laughs> BA, i turned around b i'm playing some blackjack playing they moved the table from 25 bucks to 50 bucks i'm like i'm out of here right i'm done so i start trying to find them they're like hey i'll come down and get you we're over here at this club and uh, i would go to walk up we're all casual and dude's like he ain't getting in here with him flip-flops on that, that guy was like this guy's from atkinson county not even close, <laughs> not even close. <laughs> You know when you roll with BA, the, the VIP doors just open up everywhere. They do. <laughs> they do. BA in the tucked in polo. That's, that's uh, <laughs> you know, BA in the tucked in polo. That's uh that, that may be what I um that may be what we name his memoir. There you go. I love it. <laughs> How's it been no, going for you, Jeff? The name of the memoir would be I'm only gonna keep you a little bit here. <laughs> 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 Which is great because I mean, heck, he he supports our business. Fans love him. Everybody loves. Him. I don't know anybody that doesn't love Brandon, but like, I love that. That would be like euphemisms in his show. If anybody ever wanted to make a drinking game out of it, you know, he we know we, everybody gets the sponsor in. That would be one. He complains about he complains about um, George and I having a five star receiver. You know, not getting enough guys. That you know that that's what he does, man. Like he just drifts. You know, like everybody's got that crush or the infatuation. I think Brandon will finally be happy when Georgia wins by 50 and there's a receiver that goes in the first round and has three touchdowns in the national championship game. He'll feel like Clint Eastwood and Unforgiven just walking off because he's like, what else can I do? What else can we do here now? Hey, he, was, he almost had it this past year because they had the 50 and Lad McConkey caught two touchdown passes in that game. So, you know, it was close. We almost satisfied him this time around. <laughs> were you, did, you were out in L.A., right? Did you go out? Yeah, I somehow subject myself, which is – now, listen, this is great. Love what we do, love our business. But I somehow go from, like, Peach Bowl to All-American Game 1 to All-American Game 2, and then you have a flight to Indianapolis or to so- SoFi and then come back home. And, like, when I, by the time I get home, I'm just trying to make sure that there are no razors in my house where somebody else has, like, moved in because I've been gone for, like, <laughs> 14 days. <laughs> <laughs> Who's loafers be, are these? I, I've done I've done that stretch, Jeff, and you got to be conscious about when you turn the boxers inside out. You know, I mean, when you're when you're when you're moving the underwear around is is very key in that uh, bowl stretch for sure. <laughs> um, no, thank you so much for coming on with us, Jeff. Uh, excited to have you on, buddy. Uh, like we said, a good friend of ours, and um, 
Uh, you know, just one of the things we like to do here is we like to take people back a little bit. And um, obviously, I know your roots a little bit, um, but I want to know, like, the, the Jeff Tell story. Uh, you know, how does this all get started? How does Jeff Tell end up, uh, uh, you know, covering for uh, uh, Dog Nation and uh, doing recruiting and, and being the guy? So, well, I appreciate that. Checks in the mail, by the way, Jake. Um, <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, I guess where it starts, and I've had to share this story a lot, like, and Jake's from Fannin County, and I'm from Gilmer County. So, folks, that is about as North Georgia as you can get. I, I mentioned that we were enemies last night on the show <laughs> for that reason. I mean, we, we're, we, you and I are friends, but, but from a high school standpoint, we are deep enemies. There's nobody I hate more than a Gilmer Bobcat. Maybe so, a Copper Basin, uh, Copper Basin Cougar. So Georgia, I mean, not Georgia, but like Gilmer, the team they hated the most was Pickens County. And like, it was, tr it was traditional every year where like, I remember growing up, somebody would take a sledgehammer and bust open the Gilmer high sign and they would pour green paint over it. And it sounds like something out of varsity blues. Right. <laughs> and like some years you would hear that, you know, that was, self-afflicted wounds just to just to amp the team up for the game and you know my earliest memories of Fannin County was there was a restaurant we always used to go to after church on Sundays and it was called the Yellow Jacket you familiar with that restaurant in Fannin hey, County come on don't do not come at me like this do not come at me asking if I'm familiar with the Yellow Jacket Everybody, man like the spaghetti the spaghetti was tremendous the salad bar was exceptional it was across <laughs> from where they would pump the gas for you it was a tremendous and, and the spaghetti, listen, it was not an Italian restaurant, just so we're all clear. The spaghetti was just a feature of the menu. You could also get like a fried pork chop, whatever you wanted. It was it was just good down home cooking. But the, the yellow jacket, an absolute classic, man. So I so early at an early age, I cross-referenced Fannin County with Yellow Jackets because they mm -hmm. had a restaurant named the Yellow Jacket in there. Thought so I thought that was North Avenue trade school type territory. <laughs> I, it's, it's because West Fannin is there. And West Fannin High School uh, was the Yellow Jackets. That was their mascot. Now, oh, that's where I went yeah. to elementary school. Um, <laughs> now, my grandfather graduated from West Fannin High. But when I was a kid, West Fannin was the elementary school in uh, Blue Ridge, or one of the elementary schools in Blue Ridge. And we were the Yellow Jackets. So, yeah, that's where the Yellow Jacket stems from, is uh, uh, from the high school. So, to answer your question about the origin, uh, so this is pretty cool. Like I grew up in a small town. My, uh, my uh, grandfather ran a sawmill. He was the foreman of a sawmill and he would come home from work. I remember the blue Silverado pickup truck coming over my grandma's house, my mama's house. Everybody's got a mama and papa, right? Or pe so like, I remember the blue Silverado truck and he'd pull in and like, it was the greatest thing in the world to see my grandfather. Um, God rest his soul. And what he would do is he would, I'm probably eight, nine, 10 years old is he would throw an Atlanta Journal-Constitution in my lap. And he would say, tell me what happened. Tell me what happened. And it was Dominique. It was Steve Barkowski. It was like, you know, John Conkak, Dominique Wilkins, glory days of mid-'80s, late-'80s sports in, in Atlanta. And really, it made, a, it made a profound impression on me to the point where I was like, you know, you're not supposed to know what you're supposed to do when you're 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. But for me, I was like, I always want to write for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. I want to be the person that puts the words on the paper. Well, now it's the web page uh, and gets the gatekeeper that information to tell others how cool this is. So like from that point, it was almost a singular shot where I was going to be a journalist. Um, of course, played sports in high school, but like, you know, went to school at Georgia. But like for me, if you would ask 12 year old Jeff, hey, you know what? This is 45 year old Jeff. Guess what I'm doing? A 40 year old Jeff. Guess what I'm doing? I'm covering the Georgia Bulldogs. And 10 year old me would be like, man, we won. That's our that's our back to back natties right there. So in a nutshell, it's kind of funny how the impression left on me by my by my wonderful grandfather kind of just steered me into the career I am today. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's I like I said, man, I, I got a deep affection for the guys because we got Jordan Hill over at, uh, you know, over at uh, Dogs 247, who's from Pickens County. It's a small area, man. And people, if people, if you're not from here, you don't get it. Although I know Atkinson County is similarly small, just on the other end of the count or on the I mean, other state. You need a green card. I mean, it's so different. <laughs> it, it really is. It's, I mean, it's unbelievably different. I mean, in Atkinson County, you know, like, you know, my dog ran away one day and I watched it happen for three days. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, it's, it's, it's flat and it's just different. So, 
No, I mean, yeah. I've, I've been up that way. And, you know, I, I mean, I love being a North Georgian now, Northeast Georgia guy. I love it here. But, you know, it's, it is it is very different. But it is funny how so many of us on this beat, um, not Connor Riley, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, from, he's a big city Connor, uh, <laughs> not Brandon Adams. Um, he's big city Brandon. Not but, Palmer you know, Tom. So, not Palmer Tom. Not Palmer Tom says he's from the music city. He's from yeah. the biggest of big cities now. Oh, these Montgomery days. Bell Palmer. That what was yeah. what we call him. Yeah, that's private right. school Palmer. By our private um, school Palm. That's what we call him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah. you know, it is funny how so many of us come from kind of small towns. I mean, I believe probably you know even Rusty, grow, you know, growing up in Rome. I believe Rome when Rusty was there back in the '60s was probably pretty pretty small too. So. Porter Osborne is correct here. Good looking women in North Georgia, Northwest Georgia. I can confirm that there are beautiful women here. That's because the good looking people here get married in high school and they just stay, right? So it's, <laughs> like they, it's just like they just beget good people. Like it, it, it's, yeah. a, it, it's a function of the, the, the small town, man. Where, uh, so you go to Georgia, Jeff, first job. You know, like, and and how did that all go down? I think a lot of people have like a, a fun story about kind of that first gig, that first job. Mm -hmm. What uh, what do you remember about that? So, I guess I'm in I'm in Georgia. I think I'm in my second year, and I wanted to be, you know, obviously at that point, journalism was blurred. Like, I wanted to be on ESPN, and I was like, it's a pretty cool story, guys. I had a, and I don't even know if anything I've done in the Georgia market tops this, even considering the last two years is. My, I spent two seasons working as an intern for Lauren Smith. And that meant that uh, I was really kind of connected to a whole lot of it. And um, that allowed me to spend summers um, interning with Larry Munson and Jeff Van Oat at 680 The Fan. Wow. And um, sooner or later, I'll get around to writing this. But I, for like a good 35 days of my life in a row, I, saw, I hung out with Larry Munson for like five hours every day. And I can remember – I can remember – being at a remote and I, I'm going to say this, and this is, I'm sure the audience will appreciate it because this is after dark. I'm one of the few people on the Georgia beat. I bet that can say Larry Munson served as his wingman. Now here's the story. We're sitting there in a bar on a remote and I'm like the, he goes over and this is a, he would say pretty looking gal. And he would say, he say, listen, now this guy over here, don't look at his way. Cause he's not going to look at you. I don't care how cute you are. It's like he's going to be a journalist. He's driven on his career. He's not he, he's not having any relationships. He doesn't want any anchors. He is all about succeeding in this business. So and he, I didn't even know he had this had this stuff. And then like towards the end of the remote, like somehow on the bill, there's like a number on the receipt and says, please call me. And I was like, that's Munson for you. Munson. If, if, if anybody really wants to know the real Munson, it's a little bit across of what you see in the movie Grumpy Old Men. And I mean, just funny, hysterical. Like he's that, you think like you, everybody remembers the classic tapes now and he's on the radio and like, you know, hobnail boot or skin of our teeth or all that stuff. That's the way he is talking about how it was to get coffee one day or, or his, <laughs> his, his car broke down or something like that. He would be that demonstrative. He would be that descriptive. Like when someone would come in and do the traffic report and, you know, it, it would be cold in there because they let some air in the studio. He was always like that. Always like that. Like he would describe now, imagine Munson at a Starbucks and Munson would take like 30 minutes to describe his order. Like the, the venti latte caramel macchiato. I mean, he would be all over <laughs> there. Um, and so that was great. I mean, that was uh, 96, 90, 97, 98. And like, um, heck, I even have to, you'll never hear me denounce moving the Georgia Florida game out of Jacksonville because the 97 game was the night I met my wife. Uh, and like, we were, we, we, you know, obviously the backstory on that would have been, she was hanging out with her friends. I was hanging out with my friends. One of my best friends was a male nurse of all things, like the original Gaylord Fokker. And he was like, <laughs> he, he, was, he, was in, he was in nursing school in Athens, school of nursing in Athens. And there's like 33 guys and there's like three girls. And so like he had incredible odds. And like, so if Georgia doesn't beat Florida for like the one time in a 12 year span, Florida was favored by 20 points. That's the Robert Edwards game, the 37, 17 game. If Georgia does not beat Florida that night, I'm not going out. She's not going out. And we don't have as many happy centels in our household as we do right now. 
I, I can tell by the way that you uh, uh, were so quick to pull that Fokker reference that you have used that with that man many, many times. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny. He's not even in nursing anymore. He like did it for like two years because he knew he'd have a job. Then he went into information corporate security now. And it's like the things you do, like he, he went to college and he's like, I want to have a major where I'm going to have a job anytime I want to have a job. And that's why I went into nursing. And then sure. like from that, the rest is history. So you start getting paid, all right, at some point, I'm yeah. sure, as you start getting, you know, have some jobs. Where in all of you work, man? Because I, I know one of my favorite things about talking to Andy Staples was the 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 Gainesville to Knoxville to Gainesville to, you know, where where have you been? What have you done? Who have you worked with other than, you know, the guy that I think we would all empty our bank accounts to go work with if we could have? Brandon Adams, that is. Yeah, Brandon Adams. <laughs> so it's, it's very much like the Staples story. It's funny. Seth Emerson, our friend – had a um, tweet today where people talking about how high school games are now being AI generated and how it's like the team came back seven to six and in the third quarter, it was 14 to six. And for me in this business, I think for young writers, it's so important to cover high school right out of the gate because you have no SID, you have nobody setting up an interview. You have nobody letting you know, like you got to get through gatekeeper to talk to a kid at practice. You keep your own stats at a game, which is horrendous when you're trying to do that you have to write your story you got to be in by deadline but I think that teaches you all the things you need to do in this business and for me I went from Georgia to Savannah 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 Morning News um, and then from Savannah to Northern Virginia I got to cover Champ when he was in uh, Washington and I even get to I even got to see I, I tell you what, if, if there was such a thing around right now, because I was there during the Spurrier years. I got to cover the Washington Redskins games during the Spurrier years. And I remember there was a sequence. I could have sold the pictures of Steve Spurrier in a press conference for like 30 bucks a pop on eBay. Because I was in the press room and I said something like, Steve, I said, this was a game where they had like 15 penalties or whatever. And I said, Steve, how can you put your finger on why you have so many uh, procedure penalties in the NFL with professionals when you never had those problems in college at Florida, not to this extent. And he literally hammered and heat and hauled for like, for like a good 10 seconds. Like, I, I, I just don't know. I just don't know. And that was like, to me, that was like Darth Vader unmasked because Spurrier was that dude. He is an absolute legend, but not, he wasn't that way in the NFL from Washington. I went to uh, Augusta covering prep still in Augusta from Augusta to Birmingham. It really feels like, Crash Davis and Kevin Costner in Bull Durham. Like you go from all these towns around the South, Birmingham for seven years. And then I've been here in Atlanta covering the dogs for Dog Nation and the AJC's vertical um, since 2015, I believe. Like, I think, you know, that's, that's the one of the cool things about this. Everybody thinks we always work for these various companies and like we're bitter or we're like, like I can remember my first day, it was a, it was a, it was a Georgia camp, I think. And that was Notori Johnson when he was like, Oh yeah, like an eighth grader and like looked incredible. Coach Rob Sale was there, and he like, had, uh, like he had like blue and purple hair. Yeah, he did. Yeah, and uh, Justin Schaefer was there too, yeah. and it was like um, first day. Roddy, Roddy the Bolsey comes up to me and he's like, "Hey, new guy." He goes, uh, "He goes here." And he hands me like a Powerade, and I'm like, "Oh, that's the way it's going to be, huh? That's just great." And like you keep meeting all these really good folks, and I don't think it's just because we're all from small towns, but because we all realize how how blessed and fortunate we have to do this where guys, I don't know about you guys, but I talk to so many people and they're like, I go to this side, I read it. I go to this side, I read it. I go to this side to read it. They read everything. They're insatiable about how much they want to read. And that's because they just love this football team so much. And they're just so passionate about pulling for the dogs and rooting for the dogs. And so it's like a lot of times all of us are kind of like just very thankful that we all have our little corner of this niche where we can feed the masses, everything we know about Georgia football. But I think we would all agree that if you if you park and you're walking into a game with with BA, he's the guy that just gets pulled over the most. Oh, it's BA. That's BA. And the next thing you know, you're either you're walking on without him or you gotta wait on him because he's over there, he's gotta shake hands and he's gonna tell every single person that's that's listened to the show that he really appreciates them listening to the show. Yeah. And that that's just one of the it's it's crazy. It, it really is nuts. I mean, it, it's funny how we're all considered um and and it's this way definitely kind of outside of the you know internet, 
we all hang out. We all do stuff together. We all try to have a, find a way to have a good time. Media parties are great and, and all that stuff. And um, I, I mean, I can't, I don't think I've had a contentious interaction with any of you guys ever. Uh, but it's so, it's so weird how people think we're all basically the same thing. You know, they're like, yeah, you're uh, you, I can't tell you how many people are like, oh, so you work for dog nation. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Sure, we sure. compete against them. I well, love those no, dudes, but no, you know, you know, this is true. Everybody thinks we work for Georgia. Yeah, so That's many. Yeah. 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 Oh, so you work for Georgia. Can you give me tickets? Yeah. <laughs> my, my favorite one is, um, my favorite one's like my mom's, you know, friend from, you know, high school jumps on Facebook and sees an article that I wrote and she'll post it and she'll say, here's my friend, Bonnie's son, Jake. He, re- he, he works for the Bulldogs. He's a scout. Like, he's yeah, a scout. Yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah, he, yeah. He works for the Bulldogs. <laughs> it's, like, hard no, to, it's hard to explain the, no, exactly what it is. I cover the bull. What, what does that mean? And I, every time I tell them I'm covered, I cover the Bulldogs. I want, I, I think, I feel like they're, yeah, they think I'm technically grabbing a quilt and like putting it over Ugga's head or something. You know, like, you know. I think I think the first like six years I did this, my parents did not believe that it was a real job, despite the fact that I paid my bills and my rent. A lot of people have sports blocks, Jake. Yeah, oh, buddy, you you know about <laughs> yeah, you know about that. Yeah, Ru- uh, Roos had a guy who works with Centel that whenever he uh, when he walked away from Clark Central, um, told him, "Hey, Jake." A lot of guys have sports blogs, it's you true. know, like, like kind of as a discouragement and, uh, you know, yeah, it is what it is. It um, is what it is. No, uh, now Jeff, I'm, I'm curious. And I wanted to ask you this actually on the show. Uh, you were with, you were the, with the Birmingham news. And, um, so where did you guys, where did you live in town? I live in Hoover, uh, oh, yeah. not too far from, well, now it's probably not a great place to live, but like the Winfrey, um, you know, that okay. area. Uh, and it's funny, I so like Rush Propes intersected with that guy, uh, Josh Niblett, when he now he's at Gainesville High School, uh, covered his teams. I mean, that's really a run. Like when you ever look back on your your time, like here's here's something that either makes me feel like, well, I mean, like it's funny, my old sports editor, uh, Tom Ehrenberg, really great guy. Now he teaches journalism at the University of Alabama. He sent me a he sent me an article in the news headline like a week ago, two weeks ago. And it was when Drake Kirkpatrick Jr. Um, had went down to his Final Four. And he's like, he sent me a link. And when Drake Kirkpatrick was a super senior in it, in Alabama, his senior year, I wrote a story and everybody's like, hey, try to write something about this kid we don't know before. Like nobody knows. So I, I talked to his family. I got to, you know, talked to his inner circle. And he was, um, it was one of those typical, typical storylines where, the young man was surrounded by the wrong influences. He was out in the streets late at night. And he had, um, I guess he had a turning point in his life, which is he conceived a child when he was like 16 years old. And that child saved his life because it got him out of the streets. It got him away from those terrible choices he was making. And he was like, I'll never forget. Dre told me, he said, it was, from that moment on, it was not about me. It was about that child. And everything I had to do had to take care of that child. And to see Drake Kirkpatrick Jr. Now, back in the day, Drake Kirkpatrick Sr. was like Ellis Robinson IV, number one player in the country. Yeah, I mean, this was like Saban's first really big gets with Kirby at Alabama, one of the you know the the cornerstones, capstones as they like to call it, of the Alabama dynasty. And now to kind of see, to kind of see what is eighteen years later, sixteen years later, that his son is committing to Alabama, kind of crazy, kind of surreal moment that. you know, time in Birmingham uh, kind of now leads to, you know, it's and it's funny. It, it, everybody called him like the headlines were like a legacy commitment. But I was like, folks don't really know how important Drake yeah. Patrick Jr. was to Alabama's run. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. No, I was I was I was honestly I was curious about the Birmingham stuff, particularly because my dad. Um, but when, when growing up, my parents were divorced. My dad lived in Birmingham and uh, I grew up in uh, the Blue Ridge area. And uh, I spent a lot of time in Birmingham and I love Birmingham. And I think Birmingham is a severely underrated city. And so I was curious as to your thoughts as to Birmingham as an underrated city. It's a very underrated food city. And I, know, I agree completely. I know like, like they, they're very, they're like places like Homewood and Vestavia. Um, like folks don't get this about Birmingham. Now there's a lot of reasons. I'm not, I'm not employed by the chamber of commerce in Birmingham here or anything like that, but I, I guarantee you anybody listening, anybody watching, 
find me another 15 miles of earth where you can say that um, Willie Mays, Bo Jackson, and I guess even Jameis Winston, a guy that was a Heisman Trophy winner or whatever, those guys all, all came out of like a 15-mile epicenter in, in Birmingham, Alabama, like Fairfield, Fairfield Alabama, Bessemer, Alabama. Yeah. Like, don't, I mean, like, really don't sleep on that Winston stuff because Winston was an All American, Under Armour All American in baseball. And he was a, basically, before they really were really five stars, I guess, a five star quarterback in uh, football, won the Heisman, uh, number one overall draft pick. I mean, you want to talk about checking boxes. The guy did a lot of that athletically. Yeah. Can you uh, listen? We, we had somebody reach out to us. We got sources, Jeff. We got good sources over at Dogs HQ. Um, heard there was a kerfuffle uh, over near the border of Georgia and South Carolina here recently, where where our man Lauren Smith kind of got hung out to dry uh, at a at a border. You heard, 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 heard you had an engagement at the Augusta Bulldog Club here recently that maybe, <laughs> maybe took a turn. Maybe took a turn down I sixteen, perhaps. <laughs> not not your fault, obviously. <laughs> So it's, yeah, I mean, I guess you're referring to like, I, you know, I do that every year. One of the things I said is I've, I, one of my stops is in Augusta. Yeah. And I think every year, like Augusta was really home to me. It's where my, my daughter was born. And like, so like every time it's kind of like, you know, the Bear Bryant story, like mama called. Yeah. So like for me, whenever Augusta, anything you have to do with Augusta, it's like, hey, can you come down, you know, talk about the Bulldog Club? And I must have done it like six, seven years in a row. Like this year, it was a day where they were like terrible storms. I think it was last Monday. And you remember how bad it was in Athens. And I'm literally mm-hmm. driving and there are like trickles of lightning everywhere. And I, I normally like I used to have in-laws that lived on Lake Kakoni. And I know from Atlanta, it takes me about an hour 30, an hour 45 to get to uh, to get to like that that Lake Oconee exit where there's a Home Depot, Green County, you take a left and you got a little bit of go, ways to go. And like it took me like four hours, four and a half yeah. hours. And the interstate was shut down. Like it was shut down going forward. And it was like back roads. So everybody was going back roads. And like I told him, I was like, listen, like the meeting, I left my house at like 1.30 for like a seven o'clock meeting. And I was still like, it was like 5.30 and my GPS still said I was like an hour away. I like, I could go to freaking Daytona, Orlando in the time. <laughs> yes. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. like, I don't want to like, listen, I can't make the meeting. And it was just basically like, cause the GPS, everybody was doing the same thing. And apparently it was tragedy. Somebody lost their life, but like, Oh man, like you went, you, you, I remember being stuck like a mile before the exit. And I went like that one mile, like 45 minutes. Everybody was taking the same off. They were trying to get the same way. I was like, Augustus closed, man. I don't think I can get there. <laughs> and it was like, I, I regrettably, you know, Steve Hardy, uh, one of my, I mean, Ken Hardy, one of my very greatest friends, I covered his sons when they played for West side high school. Um, he invites me every year, takes care of us and everything else. Like that. I was like, Ken, I can't make it, man. I literally can't make it unless you got to send me a chopper, send the chopper. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Where I can make it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the way I heard it, somebody, somebody had told me. Um, so Kevin Butler couldn't be there. And I think Drew was supposed to be there as well. And he couldn't be there. Yeah. And the only guy, I guess, because Lauren had gone up the day before Lauren was the only guy there. And at how old is he? 87, 86 years old now? Probably something um, like somewhere that. right in that area. I was talking to Ryan Dennis about it right around the time that he wrote the book. You know, him and Kirby kind of co or he wrote that book with Kirby uh, about the 2021 team. It was like, man, Lauren just stepped right in like a champ, you know, hour and a half, held court, told stories. It zoomed right by. It was amazing. Could you have had a more perfect guy in the moment? If you needed somebody to just fill time, just get. I, to- I'll use a term that Lauren likes to use: a a, a true rank on tour, man. A, yeah, a true absolutely. One. absolutely, absolutely one of the best there's ever been. What was? Yeah, yeah. What is he like? I mean, everybody knows like Lauren. What do you got? Well, we're not here on the sideline, you know. And and it, it's it's like, but my favorite, you know, things of Lauren were like. You know, Larry's calling a game. It's in the fourth quarter against Auburn in '96, and he's like, "We're driving. We're trying to, we're trying to win. We're trying to punch it in." And and Lauren's like, "Well, hey, we're down here. We're talking to the cheerleader from the 1966 home." <laughs> you know, yeah. oh, thanks, Lauren. And he just gets back to it. You know, but uh, what, what's what's Lauren like? Um, kind of out and about and, and doing his thing. Any eccentricities with that dude? Yeah, you know, first of all, he's a true Renaissance man. He's a guy that likes wine. He's a guy that likes to travel. He likes to go across the pond. 
I think the man literally knows everybody and he re he read so much. I can remember one of the things he would do back in the days is he would dictate everything. Like he would have somebody drive him around and this is like late nineties. And I was he's a student intern. So I was usually the driver. I actually drove him to one of those bulldog club meetings when I was the student intern and in, for the Georgia bulldog club. But it was like, he took advantage of like it really at a really early age. I saw what time management skills were actually really like. He would literally like have the, an old micro cassette recorder and he would dictate everything that he was doing, like entire letters to somebody for like promotions or things for Georgia. He'd be setting up parties, tailgates way down the road. And he would all just have it on a micro cassette, micro cassette. And then he would basically, when he got back to the office, he would drop the micro cassette off and there would be his correspondence. The man would go through like so many stacks of paper. He would read his mail. He would like take advantage of all that time he was spent driving somewhere. And he would uh, he would find a way to get it all done. And it was really amazing how he got everything done um, in, in such a really, you know, he, he, I figure he crammed about 15 hours of work into about eight hours, 10 hours of work every day. And he got all that from Dan McGill. And one of the things he, I, I know when he was like trying to teach me and try to instill things in me and, is that was the same role he had as the student assistant for Dan McGill going back. You know, that's you want to talk about. Uh, a bloodline. You want to talk about a, a coaching tree right there underneath Dan McGill, probably one of the greatest bulldogs ever. Like if you get around some really um, diehard dogs, guys that have been there for forever, guys that were already um, throwing it down in the eighties uh, when things were so great, they'll tell you that when they, that Rushmore bulldog question comes up, they still have to find a way to get Dan McGill on their all time bulldog Rushmore. I can. See. I came from the. I came from the Jake Rowe coaching tree, so obviously <laughs> things aren't going so well. Um, but we're we're making it work. Uh, <laughs> Jeff. Yeah. Now these days, though, I know you're. Uh, what are you? You're in like what Woodstock area? Kennesaw? Yeah. Yeah. Really great. Okay. Really great area. Yeah. Like everybody asks, like you live in Athens, right? And I was like, well, number one, we got two guys in Athens, and number two, you know, you both have got you both the guys have done this. What I do for Dog Nation. There's really not a lot of players in Athens. Even if you expand it to the the nether regions of, you know, you get Jefferson here, you go up to Raven you're, County. You're, here. you're thankful when Malachi Starks goes to Jefferson. That's yeah. What I would say. yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know, I will say, you know, Gwinnett County's pretty convenient. I spent Gwinnett a lot County's of time in Gwinnett bad. County when I was doing Friday nights. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's funny now since they recruit so much nationally. And it's like I was telling somebody, they're like, what's it like covering? And I was like, I'm going to tell you, and you know, you know, Jake, you can, you can speak to this as well as anybody, but like, I really feel without sounding really conceited because it's not totally this way, but it's about 90% this way. I feel like, especially for NIL, Georgia was more selecting players than recruiting players. Oh, like, sure. like it got to the point where it's like, when you knew Georgia was putting the full court press on a kid and you knew they wanted them and you know, it's a position of need. And even if the depth chart wasn't great, I think the kit rate for a lot of Georgia guys was like 80, 85%. And I remember you weren't, you weren't losing guys to Missouri. Yeah. That's what I would say. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like an Alabama could swoop in on you, a USC, you know, like that kind of thing. Missouri wasn't happening a lot. And, but, but that's, but it's different now. And, and, and rightfully so. I think things have changed, right? Yeah. It's different. Like, like it's funny. We were, uh, you know, two guys I respect a lot in this business. We were, I won't, I won't say the name, but like we were at a, about a year ago, we were at a um, commitment ceremony and we all knew the way it was supposed to go. Cause everybody goes like, Hey, so-and-so's there. Jeff's there. So-and-so's there. That's where it's supposed to go. And like, you heard like, and you know, the interviews were already done. Stories were already written. And this is like 30 minutes before putting the hat on. And they're like, we have a development. Things have changed. And now they got to change back. So hold your horses. And then they did change back in George's favor, but we kind of all looked at each other and we're like, man, I don't, I don't think the days of all showing up on these things, uh, go driving a fur piece, driving a country mile to get to somebody. Fur piece. <laughs> <laughs> I had to speak West Fannin for Jake right there a little bit, but like, yeah. oh, I um, love it. But like, you sit there and you go, yeah, this this business is changing a little bit, and especially now, it's like I, I was talking to a lot of guys on the beat. They're like, hey, man, like what do we do now? We've got 26 commitments and there's only going to be like five more, maybe four out of the five everybody's writing about. And you're like, what do you do now? And I was like, well, first of all, we don't really have this happen all the time. Normally Georgia's got like 18 guys committed right now. I think Georgia, I think that rule's still in place where 
even if you carry things over for official visits from one year to the next, I think they've only got like four left total, four or five left total out of the yeah. 56 they're allowed to get. And it's like, everybody's like, well, do people want to read about 2025s? And I was like, well, probably not. I, hope so. I hope so. They better. <laughs> yeah, they better. And that's what we got. That's what you got to do. But it, yeah. otherwise, you're going to be writing about how great Night Cars Catch was or how great Nitro Tuggles playing right now and everything else like that. Well, I was asking you, though, too, about where you're living now, because I need to know when I come down to the, the area, uh, Kennesaw esque, uh, where do you eat? What, what, what's, what's the spot, man? What a burger. What a burger. What a burger. Come well, on. First of all, um, wait a minute. Yeah, I, can I just say this real quick? Like, I, I love people from Texas, okay? Like, I, I like Ben Baby and Dan Matthews. I knew and, you were going to say Dan. We were going to have a Whataburger talk. I knew you were going to bring up Dan Matthews. Well, it's, it, you know, that, that old joke, that old joke, like, you know, a vegan, you know, a vegan and a CrossFitter walk into a bar. Well, how do you know? They told you in the first five minutes. Um, you know, <laughs> That you can throw a Texan in there too. The Texans will tell you real quick, like where they're from. Um, our Texans, Texans are so full of shit when it comes to like, oh, Whataburger's amazing. I mean, their chicken sandwich is it's solid. Fine. Otherwise, it's, it's fine. very average. It's fine. It's fine. It's very average. It's like it's Wendy's. Do you have any um, reporting on the banana pudding milkshake? I've heard that's something you try there. Uh, I've never had it. I would like to. I would like to report. Big on banana that. pudding guy, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nanner pudding, pro banana pudding show here. Yeah, yeah. the Bar official Dark. the official dessert of of the of Bark After Dark. <laughs> Put it down. Write it down, Palmer. Uh, no, where are we going? Where are we going when we're coming to Jeff Sintel's neighborhood? Where are you taking us for dinner, man? Oh well, first of all, it's it's really a spot. Like they've got a couple of rooftop bars in downtown Woodstock now, where train tracks used to be, and the train train still goes through. And there's a place. Um, it's really cool. Um, you guys are connoisseurs. You guys like music. Of course, it's nothing like the music scene in Athens or whatever, or even Austin. First of all, side road. Can you guys imagine what it's going to be like that media weekend, that that weekend in Austin in 2024? That's going to be fun. We're hatching plans already. Already in motion, huh? They're already yeah, in motion. We're, we're already trying to figure some stuff out. Everybody's going to go down on a Wednesday. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> I did that for LSU. I did that when they played LSU. I did. I went down on Wednesday. But there's a there's a venue. It's really cool. It's an amphitheater. There's an amphitheater, first of all. And I, to show you how Woodstock is thriving, I feel like I need a check from the Woodstock City of Commerce, Chamber of Commerce here. But, like, they've literally got, like, C-list entertainers now coming to Woodstock. I think, like, I think Charlie Daniels was there. I think uh, some American Idol finalists are, were there. But it's, like, it's all in, like, it's open container through downtown Woodstock now. Wow. And, like, Beale Street. That's changed. It's changed a lot since I went there for prom to the Connie house uh, for prom dinner uh, my senior year of high school. Their white sauce is incredible. Still recommend Connie house. It's a cool place. A couple of cool places. There's a place called Pie Bar where you can get great pies in like a bar. But like the one cool spot is there's a venue. It's called Mad Life, and there's a uh, there's a basically it's an indoor concert hall holds about fifteen hundred people, whatever. And like, there's some fun to be had in that place because you can get some folks in there. They've got shows at like, you know, eight thirty and like eleven o'clock at night. They got a guy playing out amphitheater, usually on an acoustic guitar, and um, a lot of '80s cover bands come through. '90s cover bands come through. Um, a lot of fun. Like, there's a there's one cool thing. Have you heard of it? Guardians of the Jukebox. We went into this. Like, my, I got a neighborhood. All these people don't cover number one ranked nat national championship teams, and they have their weekends free. But they're like they literally have this thing called they they play all '80s and '90s music, while at the same time, behind the projector on like their little PowerPoint or whatever, you've got the iconic scenes from every movie in the '80s and the '90s behind them. So it is literally like they, a visual they scoring. They're scoring them almost. Yeah, sorta. But it's just like they're playing this music, so it hits you. It hits you audio sensory wise. And then the movies are up there and it's like the best scene of Back to the Future or the best scene of E.T. or the best scene of, you know, all of them, like all, all at once. And you're just sitting there going, I'm literally time warping through my childhood right now. It's literally like you're just living in the moment, like, you know, the say anything thing with the jukebox up there and everything. Like they literally catch the sweet spot out of every fantastic 1990s, 1980s movie while they're playing music from that genre. 
And it's one of those things where you just go like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to I don't know, listen. I don't know what to watch. It's just like it makes you want to go back and watch all those old movies again. Man, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, we, we I need to know more about, about pie bar. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you can get pie and it's bar. <laughs> yeah. What a delivery. That was great. Um, yeah, we talked about it on the show. Um, you know, these amphitheaters are are kind of killing it with um with some of the dudes they're bringing in, some of this C and B list guys. I mean, like the one in Winder, for crying out loud, one in Winder over near Lanier Tech, they had Aaron Tippett. Here wow. recently, dude, we Which had is- in we had in McKaysville, Georgia. Okay, Leroy I could Parnell. walk there within forty five seconds. I could be there. Kentucky Headhunters came and played. Wow, they sold out. It was incredible. They sounded amazing, dude. And it would have been great if you could have got Jamon Dumas Johnson to come up and go to that concert with. You. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and then the, who was got him to go up and sing Dumas Walker? <laughs> Put that, put that back in, put that in your back pocket for when he makes a play this this year. Yeah. Like, like, who was it? Like, I didn't even. This was even before my time, but like, got in Christopher Cross. You guys heard that sailing? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, sailing, every, man. like sailing. every beautiful. And I almost there. busted it out just then. And I, I know I would have <laughs> sounded like I was going into puberty if I did. <laughs> but like. Really? It's like every beautiful woman under the age of forty-two now. I think they they love Christopher Cross. They go like. They sing that song "Sailing" and then Yacht Rock. When they when they play that one, the one I really like, um, and my my genre is not usually this type of yacht rock, but it's uh, they play this song. What was it? Uh, Ride like the wind. Like I saw something on I saw something on Twitter when it was like one of the twenty songs that people that are most guaranteed to inspire happiness or positivity. And that song "Ride like the wind" was in there because who's it? Who's that? Michael McDonald singing the singing the back background vocal on that. And you're just literally like, wow. And it was like, people of all genres were like, man, this is good music. You know, like you see those YouTube videos where they're like, they've got two guys that are born in like 1998 and they're listening to a, a Bill Withers song and they're telling you how cool it is or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was sort of what it was like. All right, Jeff, we're going to send you out tonight with uh, the two questions that we ask everybody. And uh, I'll lead off since I, I kind of, uh, Uh, said that and um i'm going to do uh the worst hotel room that jeff centel has ever stayed in is where and i know that you stayed in some bad ones because i know you and i work on the same beat yeah and i've stayed in some horrible ass hotel rooms covering recruiting i'll tell you what i don't know if it's the worst in terms of like roaches rolling through the bed but i'll tell you one of the worst experiences i ever had this is a kind of a BA story is this was recently um, Gunnar Stockton was playing Thomasville in the second round of the GHSA playoffs. And uh, we, uh, we were the broadcast, you know, we do the broadcast and like I was on the sideline guy or halftime guy, in game, post game guy, type guy. And like, I think that it was 1240, 1230. We're in Thomasville proper. Uh, that was a game where Gunnar Stockton just got absolutely bludgeoned. I mean, he had like he looked like Rocky Ford. He needed a cut man after the end of that game. But then we knew Georgia Tech was playing Georgia that next morning. And to go from Thomasville at 1240 to be on the flats at like seven in the morning, I think I probably aged a full year to two years on that trip because we basically somehow we said, let's get everybody said, like, listen, there's deer everywhere. You got to get ahead of the deer. <laughs> they're like don't take it this it's way. just a road <laughs> i'll tell you what god bless the people of thomasville because like they literally almost tried to chaperone us like we'll drive the 20 miles in front of you and behind you so you don't get in trouble you get an escort yeah out of Thomas. They're they're just, I, all i can way. think about is them just plowing through deer like the like the walking <laughs> yeah deer. they're down with a bull bar just, yeah, just <laughs> them, dude. and it was it was like um and it was literally like, I mean, literally, it was just like, don't go here. Like that scene out of Monster Plantation where it's like, don't go near the bars. <laughs> yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. But it was, it was that like that. New Mark After Dark for Monster Plantation references, dude. <laughs> like, 
it's usually it's a monster mansion now. Let's be politically correct in the year 2023. But like, oh man, um, you, but you're saying that all I can do is smell the mildew in on that ride. But go ahead. Don't go in the Mars. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so we get. We, so our plan, and I don't know, this was not our finest hour of tr- strategy, but our plan was, okay, we're going to drive two hours, then we're going to sleep two hours, and then we're going to drive the remaining four hours to get up to Atlanta. I think we landed in Cordell, and as far as um, Rocket as far, City, as far as Cordell goes, that hotel room we stayed in, let's just say it was forgettable, um, and it, it was the worst thing getting up and like, okay. Now we got to drive, and then we got to go to Georgia Tech, and then we got to watch Georgia beat Georgia Tech's breaks off. And that game is so boring. Like yeah. it's the only game all year long, Jeff, where I like I'll bring I'll have a game going on on my computer. I'm watching Ohio State Michigan while Georgia's playing Georgia Tech. I, I the least attention I pay to a game all year. You see them at beautiful Hyundai Field though now, and that's mm. incredible. There's nothing like Bobby Dodd Stadium at Hyundai Field. Hey, Jeff, but I have always contended it is a great place to watch a game from a press box. I know you're normally on the field. Yeah. But that's that's one of the coolest press boxes, just in terms of the, f- the vision you get of the field. It's almost – I mean, it's like going to a big high school stadium in some ways. You're so close to it. What does the press corps think about moving to the West End Zone Tower? It sucks, know? man, and I'm not happy about it. Are you gonna take I've had this- a 50 yard line seat. I've had 50 yard line seats Georgia games given to me for the past <laughs> eight years of my life. Yeah, imagine selling that to a donor, man. That's not working. There, nobody's happy about it. That's that makes sense. Oh, but right, I, to answer your question better and simpler, I could say about five hotels in Mississippi. Normally, when you're yeah. in the state of Mississippi. This is where I'm not working for the Chamber of Commerce here in Mississippi. But, like, I think your hit rate on a nice hotel in Mississippi, if it's not connected to a casino, is very, very poor. It's going to no, be more. Tupelo has got some good stuff. Mine was home in Louisiana, easily. Uh, going, I went to see Mason Smith, and I wow. stayed at, I stayed in a Red Roof Inn in Homa, and there was blood on the sheets, and the hair dryer caught on fire. Um, so, And there was a water bottle under – a crushed water bottle under the bed from the Ooh. previous – I hope the previous guest, maybe from – the previous previous guest i don't know hopefully and mine, and mine was the roadway in in boulder colorado 2010 when when some we slept about 11 people in the roadway in uh two two bed uh one bath uh yeah it was a lot of people it was hard to find a place on the floor to sleep but i did wow yeah it was uh we you know didn't want to spend money we were we were uh we were we weren't even college kids we just had <laughs> we're just idiots we just did it <laughs> All right, Jeff, uh, it's fun that I get to ask you this question because we've actually had a person give you as the answer to this question. Mm. Um, (laughs) That's true. I forgot about that. (laughs) Yeah. Brooks Austin gave you uh, that made you the answer to this question. Mm. Um, And for good reason, uh, because you're a you're a wordsmith and you're 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 a good guy. Uh, Let's say right now you have uh, they found you face down dead in a ravine somewhere. (laughs) And you get to stand above your body and you get to orchestrate how we send you out. Like, you know, you, mm. you get to orchestrate who, who gets to send you off the, the musical act. Uh, BA said Don Rickles, um, wow. you know, uh, a speaker, comedy. he wanted a roast. BA did uh, B uh, Brooks Austin, the other BA, n- nowhere near BA, but BA. Uh-huh. Uh, he said Jeff Sintel because he knew you would write him a great eulogy. You wow. would say great things about him. Uh, so, uh, who's sending you off? Who's singing? Who's who's eulogizing? Who's uh, or as Zoolander would say, ugooglizing? And uh, who wow. is um, uh, or who's roasting to get you out of here? That'd be great. Um, I mean, like you have the 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 Hallmark card answer where you're like your friends, your loved ones, your 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 you know, like the people that knew you the best. I I just want it to be some crazy party, man. That's what all, all I would want to be is I would be like. Um, you know, the things that got it, you know, like, I, I guess it's like healthy to describe it as a celebration, but that's kind of what I would want it to be like, just people hanging out, telling stories. I hope that the, the cups are rapidly filled and rapidly depleted or whatever. But like, I think, I think, I think that would be pretty cool. I think, um, you know, along those lines, I thought one of the coolest things, um, this is a story I was in Birmingham. And like um, there was a player and you know what? That's kind of what I try to do. There's a lot of people in this business that do this, this stuff amazingly well. So you got to find your own lane. And like um, 
there was a player who was a key part of a big game and his grandfather passed away like the day of the game. And this was like a kid that was like, um, you know, left tackle had an important matchup against the other guy going, you know, very important part of the game plan. And he played, even though it was devastated. And uh, he played through it, key game, his team won. And I wrote about that as kind of my column, my, my big story about the game, because everybody's like, they knew how close he was to his grandfather and they didn't expect him to play. And then he shows up in the field house like a couple of hours before. Um, and one of the things the family did, I thought that was kind of really touching, is they put – that newspaper, and we don't have that anymore. They put that newspaper in the casket with his grandfather. Um, so so his, he would know how much his grandson meant to him and everything else like that. So I would just like for, you know, not to try to take that, take that story to a morbid tone, but like I would just like everybody to take that moment. Like the first thing that came through my mind is I was like, man, I would love to get Mary J. Blige to sing my. Oh, oh wow. Wow. No, wow. Great. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah, I, I was gonna come anyway if I'm alive. I <laughs> definitely will come if Mary J. Blige, because I'm a big Mary J. Blige guy. You know, like <laughs> one of my favorite songs ever is like uh, the song "One." If you guys ever seen that that song, you two, you two song "One," when Mary J. Oh. Blige comes in and just destroys it, yeah, just kills it on the tracks and everything else like that. Um, that's something to me where, like, you know. You know, like a good buddy of mine who uh, he's got a he's got literally every Georgia football game on DVD, and now it's on his um, computer. And like we were going through, we were going through, and like um, he, he, every halftime show, every Super Bowl, everything like that. And I was like, "All right, Huckleberry, see what you got here. Show me the Prince halftime show. You know, the one where like you hear the legends of it, and you go back and they show you the live broadcast feed." And there's literally like pelts of Forrest Gump rain on the camera. They can't even keep the camera clean. And like uh, he had the one with uh, just so emotional. Remember the U2 uh, halftime show where it was right after 9-11 and I felt our country had never been more together, more tight, more together. Then, you know, they had the scrolling uh, list of all the names that were lost in the towers. And it was like something so tragic. I would just like I would just like from my last day on Earth or my last send off. I would like for something inspiring to come out of that. So I guess final answer would be Mary J. Blige is going to sing my favorite song, which might might even be one. So let me ask you this. If Roos and I are still alive, you're okay if we brown bag it at your funeral? <laughs> you better. <laughs> you better. All right. We're serving as bartenders, in fact. Yeah. We're, we're, we're listen, we're going to, hey, you want to, we're trying to pour for people. So, yeah. all right, we're good then. We, and you got for my permission, if you're there and I die before you, you, you please do the same at mine. It's on the record, on dude. The thanks record. so much for coming on, dude. I don't know if yeah. you saw all. I don't so know if you saw the comments, but uh, you got a lot of fans out there, man. A lot of people love you just like we do, and uh, we're glad that uh, we're glad that you came on and and hung out with us. This was uh, you were our you were, one of the I best. Think, I think you may have been our first like audience recommendation. Like a guy hit me up on Twitter and was like, "We got to get Jeff Sintel in." We've been waiting to invite you on. It worked out perfectly, man. Thank you so much for joining us, Jeff. It was awesome. And uh, as much fun as I expected it would be. My pleasure, fellas. Keep doing great work, man. Can't wait to read you guys again. All right, All right dude. All right, brother. See you, man. All right, Roos. Let's do a quick Jake on Jake because <laughs> that that flew by so fast. I'm looking up there at the clock now. We're almost to an hour already. I, uh, you go first. Oh, tough, man. Why why are you putting me on the spot? I feel I feel a little put on the spot. Um. All right. So, um, I'm going to Minneapolis this weekend, right? And um, so, the, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have forgotten something five times. All oh, right. yeah, you, you go to gametime.co. Game <laughs> yeah. Game yeah. We've hey, got partners. I should, I should add, I should add, I'm probably going to go use gametime.co to go get some uh twins tickets. You know what? I used gametime.co to get my Braves tickets for tomorrow night. I'm going to the Braves game tomorrow night, Braves Mets. Uh, the Braves were getting shellacked last time I looked by the Mets. Um, tonight, but what was that, 15 seconds ago, yeah, no, I, I turned it off. Right <laughs> I got so disgusted. Um, but, uh, you know, listen, gametime.co, they specialize in, in giving you the last minute ticket options. They're great at that, but listen, you can go there anytime, anywhere. The interface is amazing. The panic is not there. The, the view that you get from your potential seat is better than anything else. Cause it's actually a game time look and not really, you know, some empty stadium. 
Um, listen, these folks, it's, they're really easy to work with. And, and for a limited time right now, you can use the promo code D A W G S dogs, and you can get uh, $20 off of your first order uh, terms apply to that. But listen, this is the place you want to go to get tickets. I've been in positions where I've looked at them from a week out. I've been in positions where I've needed them a day out. And uh, GameTime.co covers you on all of that. That is GameTime.co. Go check it out. Download the app and get $20 off your first order with the promo code DAWGS. All right, Roos. Ask me some stuff. Ask right. me something. Also, uh, again, thanks to Jeff Sintel. Yeah, 100%. Tremendous performance. Probably the guy I hate least from LJ. I hate everybody from LJ, <laughs> but the guy I hate least. Um, <laughs> no, a good friend. A good friend and a good person. All right, so I'm going to Minneapolis this week. Um, and I'm just curious. When you're a guy who's traveling, I know you you enjoy travel as well. What are you seeking out? What like What's the first thing Jake Rose like looking toward? Uh, I'm assuming it's food. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you shook your head like, how yeah, let's you I food? mean, that, that's just too easy. Don't even, I mean, outside of food. Yeah. Um, so I'm, like, obviously, obviously I'm looking for breweries. I'm looking for, I, I'm a, I'm an art guy. I love an art gallery or a, a museum of art. I think that that's always cool to see what people have in Minneapolis. People have suggested the state fair. Um, which is pretty cool, and it's supposed to be a big foodie thing. But I'm just curious. Yeah, outside of the, uh, you know, looking at menus, where, where are you headed next? You know, it's kind of tough because I would like to say sporting events. Like I would like to say, you know, going to Target Field. Like you know, I, you know, I would. I would like. To, you went? Did you go see the Cubs? I did not because I went to Indianapolis. Oh, that's um, right. I went to Indianapolis, and then you know, the I was telling somebody the story the other day about how I ended up on the elevator with a couple of ladies that were in their 60s at my hotel because there was an Ed Sheeran concert in town and both of them had thick Southern accents. They were from like Mississippi and they were talking about how much they loved Ed Sheeran and how much he gave them chill bumps when he talked. And they said a lot of other inappropriate stuff too, because they were, they were drinking about the moods they would get in from listening to Ed Sheeran stuff. Sure. And boy, I couldn't get off that elevator quick enough. Sure. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I would like to say I would like, to, but I I don't like I don't normally do that. You know what I normally do when I go to New Towns, man? I eat, I fill my belly, and I lay. I give get in the bed. Palmer can attest. Like I, I go do some drinking, I go do some eating, and I I mean, you know, I tried to get y'all when we were in Indianapolis. Let's go to Slippery Noodle. I wanted to go dance, but you and Josh Payton and Palmer weren't having it. It was too cold. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, it was, was ridiculously cold. close. To it was zero. not too cold. It was ridiculous. Cold. <laughs> Our city designed for hamsters. That's what I've said since we left there, man. Because they oh. they put those tubes in place because it's too damn cold in there. Yeah, I mean, them tubes are hot. Those they were. They were. Them tubes I, are, I'm looking forward to it though, man. I think we'll have a fun trip. I'm, yeah, I, I do too. I think you have a great time, in Minneapolis. I sent you that Native American restaurant. From See, that's that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. Yeah, I, I would. I, I finally got around to looking at that menu, and it looks amazing. Um, all right, my, I've got a food question because I'm fat. Um, you've got a uh, – what is your favorite go-to – got to eat it for the rest of your life – vegetable. Not fruit, vegetable. Yikes. Uh, potato, easily. You know, but the versatility is what makes the potato at the end of the day. Are we talking sweet potato or we're talking white potato? No, white potato. White okay. potato, in my opinion. Are you a sweet um, potato fan at all? I love them. Oh, I hate them so. Oh, bad. I'm a huge sweet potato guy. I, no, I don't want to say I hate them. I, I I'll eat them, but I don't like them all. No, no, no. The tremendous sweet potato. One of my favorite things, man. I use it like a butter. You know, you just take it, quarter it up, you toss it in some stuff, you roast it off. It's sweet potato is tremendous. Uh, a little bit of butter and uh, and cinnamon with the sweet potato, tremendous. Also, the white potato though, the versatility underrated. By painting, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Buy a painting buckshot. I can't hang a, a damn painting where the, the microwave is. It has a function. Paint a mural on the front side of the microwave. <laughs> um, no, the white potato for me is is the answer. No, that's a, that's a little bit of a cheat, I feel like. I think most people would probably say that because of the versatility. I'm a big hash browns guy. I love French fries, et cetera, et cetera. Beyond that, I would say, um, I mean... It's an herb, right? But it's a vegetable. Like I keep cilantro in my fridge at all times. Uh, cilantro goes on everything pretty much that I eat. Um, uh, big carrot guy as well. Um, that's up, in there. Man? And um, 
you know, I, I get down with the uh, the broccoli slaw, the pre mixed broccoli slaw. Yeah. Not bad. You know, I, I was just thinking about, we've talked about having this guest on here, but I'm going to borrow a line from him, from Tony Schiavone. I would love to have him on at some point. I don't know if we ever will. We used to Dude, cross I'm gonna, I, might, to I might cry. I might cry if we have Tony. Yeah, I, I'd fanboy it up too much if Tony. Dude, I'm gonna be, yeah, I'm going to be like, yo, yo. But in the words of the great Tony Schiavone, we are desperately out of time. That's it for tonight for Bark After Dark. Let's get out of here, go get some sleep and work tomorrow. Um, folks, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Jeff Sintel. But we will catch up with you guys next Monday where we don't have a guest nailed down, and we almost never do. Bye. <laughs>